standby for manual transmission in three, two, one. Greetings, mercenaries, Lance Commander wannabes, and the merely curious. Manus Dextra here, and today we're going to talk about MechWarrior 5, why I'm playing it, and why you should too. I'll go over the basics of the game, show you how to start a new career, properly outfit a mech, and set up a lance to get the most out of your AI lance mates. Then we'll take a look at the star map, I'll explain how and why I pick the contracts I do, and I'll show you how to use your negotiation points to get the best terms. Finally, I'll let you watch my first drop with my brand new starting lance. Check the description for timestamps to the various sections, as well as important links mentioned in the video. And while you're there, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more MechWarrior content. It only takes a moment, and you don't even need to get up out of your chair to do your old Uncle Mattis a huge solid. So just do it, you lazy bastards. So for those who came in late, In 2108, humanity began colonizing the stars. Their reach would eventually span a vast region of space known as the Inner Sphere. During its golden age, under the governance of the Star League, the Inner Sphere experienced unprecedented peace, prosperity, and technological advancement. But with a great rise comes a great fall. Beset by greed and mistrust, humanity splintered. The Star League crumpled. Technological advancement slow. The great houses, each vying for supremacy, turned on one another, engaging in a series of conflicts known as the Succession Wars. Amidst this chaos, mercenaries became the proxy forces for the great houses. Numerous battlefields sprung up across the inner sphere dominated by hulking war machines known as Battle Max. The year is now 3015, and these steel behemoths have become the tools of the mercenaries' trade. It's a lucrative time, yet one beset with perils of all kinds. Only the most skilled and brave among them will rise to become legend. It's a dark time for humanity, but it's a great time to be a mercenary with a dropship and working battle mechs. MechWarrior 5 is a sort of hybrid FPS with simulator and RPG elements. I strongly recommend getting the base game and the first DLC, Heroes of the Inner Sphere, at the very least. This DLC adds a career mode and opens up the entire Inner Sphere for gameplay. For this guide, I will be playing in career mode, but most of the information presented will apply to any game mode, including the campaigns. The second DLC, Legend of the Kestrel Lancers, adds an extensive handcrafted campaign set during the Fourth Succession War. Your Merc Company will be employed as a special ops team supporting the Federated Sons' invasion of the Capellan Confederation over the course of 14 missions. The DLC also adds new mission types, new biomes, and urban warfare set in megacities. As of January 2022, the game and all DLC bundled, known as the Jump Ship Edition, will cost you 60 bucks on Steam. I rarely say this, but I think this game is worth every penny of that full price. However, since the game has been out for a couple of years now, you can get it even cheaper if you wait for a sale. Whatever edition you get, you'll be playing as the commander of your own small mercenary company consisting of a leopard dropship, a single lance of mechs, and a small but loyal crew. As the commander, you'll be charged with finding work and leading your mechs on the battlefield. While your executive officer runs the dropship and handles insertions and extractions. 
So most people watching this channel play Elite Dangerous. If you enjoy the combat and ship building in that game, you'll probably like this game too. On the downside, combat here is limited to PvE and co-op. But since this game is single player, there's much less grind to deal with, and that's a huge plus for me. Before we get into the game, let's talk about controls. If we click Options and the Controls tab, we'll see three input methods. Mouse and keyboard, gamepad, or joystick. The game is designed to play with a mouse and keyboard, so if that's your preferred input, you could probably hit the ground running. However, if you're old school or mostly play simulators like me, you'll probably want to try using a throttle and stick. The good news is this is totally possible, but it will make gunnery a lot more challenging. If you look under the gameplay tab and options, you can crank up aim assist to compensate for this. Be warned, the in-game support for controllers is very basic. So if you need to tweak dead zones, etc., you'll need to use third-party software or edit text files. If you want to try this and you're having problems, check the description for a link to MechWarrior 5's peripheral support page. I got my throttle and stick working well enough, but I had to use aim assist and the controls just never felt quite right. What I finally settled on was using my mouse to control the top half of the mech, that is torso and guns, and using my analog throttle to control speed. I also use one of my throttle hat switches to steer right and left. Pushing down centers the legs under the torso. This is extremely important in the heat of battle. And pulling up on the hat switch fires jump jets on the rare occasion that I actually have any installed. You know, I was really skeptical when I heard about this mouse and throttle combination but it works extremely well for me and immediately improved my performance and general gaming experience. Between the throttle and mouse, I have plenty of buttons for critical functions such as firing weapon groups, marking targets, etc. For less time critical functions like toggling maps, night vision, viewing modes, and claiming loot, I use voice attack. I also use voice attack for issuing orders to my lance mates. In addition to freeing up a lot of buttons, issuing spoken orders to the lance adds a lot of immersion for me. Whether you use voice attack or not, you will have to manage your lance well if you want to succeed on the battlefield. If you aren't sure what voice attack is, search for it on Steam. If you want to see how I set up voice attack for this game, let me know in the comments below. So if you're totally new to mech piloting, I strongly recommend starting a new campaign just to play the tutorial and maybe a few missions here. Once you get the hang of piloting, you'll have a choice to make. If you can tolerate the uneven voice acting and you're interested in the story, you can continue the main campaign. Now just to be clear, the campaign story isn't bad exactly, but it does feel very dated. You're a young, untested mech warrior avenging his father's death and all that. But if you're like me and you really aren't interested in the story, you can start a new game in career mode. This will still allow you to access the missions from the campaign, but without the story elements. Career mode is an open world sandbox experience. Here you can choose your own starting location, starting lance, and great house allegiance. No matter which game mode you choose, the information I plan to present in this guide, mech builds, general tactics, and strategies should apply. To get started in career mode, you'll need to choose single player and then choose new career. Remember, this option will only be there if you have Heroes of the Inner Sphere DLC installed. If this is your first time playing, I'd choose one of the 3015 starts. For this guide, I'll be starting in 3015, working for House Steiner. The starting lance is actually pretty effective. We'll set up the three light mechs for our AI pilots and keep the medium griffin for our personal use. Now we just need to hit continue and get this party started. I am Commander Dextra, owner and operator of Mr. Horny's Discount Mercenary, a small special ops mercenary company. You may address me as Commander, 
or boss man. You are here training because you have similar ambitions. Whether or not you have the capacity to accomplish such a goal remains to be seen. And frankly, I'm skeptical. However, if you survive Lance Commander training, you will be a weapon. You will be a minister of death, praying for war. But until that day, I will assume you are as dumb as the average mech pilot moistening chairs in the local hiring hall. Because I am hard, you will not like me. But the more you hate me, the more you will learn. I am hard, but I am fair. I do not look down upon brainwashed Capellan commoners or kiss up to stinky cheese-eating Davian nobles. Here you are all equally worthless, and my orders are to weed out all non-hackers who do not pack the gear to command a lance of valuable battle mechs. One of your primary responsibilities off the battlefield is to keep all mechs under your command properly configured and fit for fighting. One of the great immutable truths of the universe is that stock mech loadouts are always bad. Why this is the case has been the subject of much speculation. I believe it's the petty revenge of engineers for countless impregnated daughters and numerous stolen husbands and wives. Whatever the case, I will now teach you the proper way to outfit a mech for battle, and you will learn by the numbers. Step 1. Make sure the mech you are about to set up is mechanically sound. Most mechs you purchase, and all mechs recovered after a battle, will need to be fully repaired first. Step 2. Strip the mech of all optional components, weapon systems, ammo, and heat management. Step 3. Add max armor to the mech chassis. Insufficient armor is one of the biggest issues with stock mechs. Also, you will need to double check how the armor is distributed. Rear armor for medium mechs should not exceed 10 points. Rear armor for light mechs can range from 4 to 7 points depending on the model. Now I know what a lot of you are thinking, that these numbers are too low. But here's the thing. If you are getting shot in the back consistently, you are either a coward or a moron and your death in battle is merely fate dispensing some well-deserved justice. Step 4. This is where things start getting a bit more complicated. Now that armor is sorted out, we'll know how much tonnage we have left for weapons and heat sinks. The trick here is to find that golden mean between firepower and heat management. Resist the urge to fill every weapon slot. This will not be practical, especially with max armor, because after a few shots, your mech will shut down due to excessive heat. Also, when setting up mechs for your lance mates, you need to consider their strengths and weaknesses. Your typical mech pilot is a decent enough marksman, but that's about it. They cannot be trusted to manage complicated weapon setups with different ranges or manage heat issues effectively. I find that these guys do best armed with medium and large lasers and short range missiles. They also seem to do better with smaller fire groups to minimize heat buildup. Be sure to check the after action stats for each mech and pilot. If you find a well-armed mech is not doing expected amounts of damage, you probably need to adjust fire groups or add more heat sinks. Here are my recommended builds for the starting Steiner Lance along with fire groups. Now that we have our mech sorted out, it's time to pick up an extra mech pilot and find some jobs to do. When you pull up the star map, you'll see two main types of star clusters. Industrial hubs are marked as star systems connected by lines. Here is the best place to start repairs and buy mechs and equipment. These systems are also the only places you'll find mech pilots for hire. 
The other type of star cluster we're interested in is the conflict zone. Systems within these zones are where we'll find jobs. As mercenaries, we're free to take jobs from any side in a conflict. However, smart mercenaries will pick a side and stick with them because this will lead to much better contracts with more salvage and bigger payouts in the long run. To that end, we're going to look for missions in conflict zones rated for one or two points of mercenary company reputation. These will be located closer to the periphery, and we want to only do missions for House Steiner so that we can max out our faction reputation with them as quickly as possible. The sooner we do this, the sooner we'll be able to start claiming mechs as salvage after battle. When you pull up the star map, you should find a low-level conflict zone nearby. Systems with contracts on offer will have icons above them. Clicking on such a system will give you the travel costs in time and money. Clicking on View Intel after picking a system will let you see who is offering the contracts. This information is extremely important since we only want to take jobs for House Steiner starting out. Now that we have a job lined up, all we need to do is travel there, refitting our mechs en route. If your mechs aren't finished by the time you get to your destination, you'll need to advance the timeline from your home tab. Once your mechs are ready, Click on Contracts. Here you'll see all the local jobs on offer. Now just pick the one you want, allocate your negotiation points. I usually spend one point on additional damage coverage while spending the rest for extra salvage and sea bills. Then we just need to accept the contract and do the job. On the battlefield, it will be your responsibility to designate targets and keep your lance focused on your plan of attack. I cannot stress this enough. For your lance to be effective, you must lead it designating targets as you go. Set up your controls to do this efficiently. Allied Command has provided us the last known locations of the target. They are more than likely going to stick to any one of the marked locations on the map. Once you neutralize them, head to the evac point for extraction. Show maps. There they are. Got to check them out one nice at a time. Die, damn you! <laughs> Alright, so we got the spider to deal with, too. Um, so, what I'm going to try to do here is target the spider's legs. This is a technique known as, wait for it, legging and the reason that we do that is because legs present a relatively big target they're usually less well armored than like the center torso and other parts of the mech and when you destroy both legs the mech is disabled so a lot of times legging and headshots are the two quickest ways to destroy a mech and right now I don't have enough firepower to reliably do headshots but you can 
destroy legs easy enough. And so that's what uh, that's what we'll be doing for the uh, show map. That's what we'll be Close doing map. for all the mechs I encountered on this mission. Walk up to it in order to pick it up. Go. <laughs> Damn. That's close enough. Ready to start pickup operation. Plane cargo. Never pass up free loot. Brilliant. Payload acquired. We're right. not seeing our targets at this location. Make way to the next nav point. We might have more luck there. All right, so this Show is map. the last spot, and Close so map. we can expect the target and probably one or two other mechs at that location, plus tanks, turrets, all kinds of stuff. Alright, so that's them. Yeah, so there's here's some tanks over here. We'll go ahead and take care of these guys first. Target acquired. So you don't want to ignore tanks and turrets. They're a lot easier to kill than mechs. And uh, they pack enough firepower to uh, to kill you, so so yeah, you probably anytime you see a tank or a turret, you want to prioritize it because they're going to be because they're very dangerous and they're going to be a lot easier to kill than a mech. So if we can get them out of the way as soon as possible, we will be much better off. So, yeah, our target Last is just on the me. other side of the hill over here, and so I want to approach very slowly, and I kind of, I want to pull them out to us instead of rushing in to meet them that way. Target acquired. Positive yeah. visual on the target, Commander. I've marked it on your attack screen. That way we can pick off a lot of these tanks and turrets and stuff. Yeah. So this is not so this is not a target, but we need to take him we need to take him off the board because the blackjack is definitely capable of killing any and all of our mechs, so we need to take him off the board as quickly as possible. And I'm just going to concentrate on cutting his legs out from under him. And there we go. And that's our actual target. So, Lance, attack my target. So yeah, killing that guy is our actual mission objective. So since the rest of the Lance is chasing him around, I'm gonna go ahead and take out, take out those ground vehicles.
so here he comes. Center torso is not looking great, and getting in close quarters with a Shadow Hawk is not probably the best idea. <laughs> Almost got him. Gonna get the hell out of here as quick as Last we can. On me. We're not getting paid. Moving in file. We're not getting paid to fight anybody else today, so there is no reason to stick around. Just gonna weave a little bit, and hopefully dodge any uh, parting shots from those guys. As soon as we get in the green ring, we should be safe. As mentioned previously, it's very important to review the performance of your entire lance after each drop, so that you can make adjustments to maximize the performance of each mech. Before we wrap this first lesson up, I would like to talk briefly about making repairs in a conflict zone. While repairs in a CZ will take more money and time, the penalties in low-level CZs are very small. So unless you have extensive damage or you're refitting a salvaged mech, you won't need to go back to an industrial hub for repairs. Since travel costs will usually be more than the penalties early on. In the next lesson, we'll discuss the best strategies for acquiring more and better mechs, and we'll talk about building alliances beyond House Steiner. But until then, good hunting. You will now be released from manual control. Mr. Dextra thanks you for your cooperation. You will now be released from manual control. Mr. Dextra thanks you for your cooperation.